Good evening, everyone. Thank you for joining us tonight. It's going to be a night you're going to remember for a long time because this is a discussion about the progressive future of the United States of America. There's a wave that's happening in 2020, built upon a wave that began in 2018. And it's a progressive wave that is saying we have to have fundamental changes in our country. And in the same way I ran on the Green New Deal, I ran on Medicare for All, I ran on the need to have justice built into our criminal justice system, educational, health care, uh, economic system in our country. Uh, our three guests tonight are absolutely the cutting edge of the revolution which is happening out in the United States of America. And in the same way that I was not predicted to win my race running as a, a, a progressive, a progressive, progressive on every issue, none of the three who are going to be the special guests tonight had W's next to their names as wins in the beginning of 2020 in the electoral system. They are all kind of upset winners, but only upset winners as experts view progressive candidates in 2020. And now experts are starting to understand that maybe something is happening out there. Uh, and, uh, and tonight's three guests all upset conventional wisdom in 2020, as I did, and we all ran on the same issues. And we all believe that 2021 is, a, is the year where we now have to start to act uh, on what we know it is that the American people want as their agenda. So we have three history makers with us, three big change makers uh, who are already drawing national attention uh, because they're just, uh, they're, they're, they're big difference makers. So I thought maybe we could start off this evening by talking a little bit about each one of you uh, and what you were able to accomplish this year. Uh, and maybe we could just have each of you explain to our viewers what made your campaign successful? You know, what was your message that you were delivering? And maybe we could start with you, Corey, and you could uh, lay out a little bit of this um, this vision that you presented to the people in Missouri. Sure. Well, first of all, thank you for hosting this, Senator Markey. We are, you know, it, it was great watching you win. And um, and my brothers, too, was great watching them win. And uh, I'm just so excited that we're all, not only did we win, but we're connected. So, um, and, um, you know, for me, I think it was, I ran, ran in 2016, you know, um, unsuccessful in taking the seat, but successful in uh people seeing that there can be change in our communities um, just by, just because somebody stepped out. Uh, and then 2018, uh, even though we didn't do it as well as we wanted to, you know, I learned from the first race. And, you know, uh, so we had better name recognition for 2020 because of 2016 and 2018. We raised money differently. Uh, and, um, you know, being able to be endorsed by Senator Bernie Sanders and then also uh, being one of his surrogates helped being in a film called Knock Down the House uh, with AOC and um, Amy Valella and Paula Jean Swearingen, that helped. And then, but I'll say what really gave it that boost was when COVID-19 hit, because I had been speaking about Medicare for All for since 2016, and people were like, oh, that can never happen. Oh, nobody wants that. You know, it was like, oh, she's a quack because she's speaking about, you know, Medicare for All. But when COVID-19 hit our communities, people started to see why for so long I had been saying, you know, you're, uh, health care should not be connected to your job status, that everybody deserves to have health care and, and have actual care, not just access, but have actual care. And so um, people were like, OK, well, you know what? She's she's been saying the same thing. And now we see why. And then um, I was vulnerable my, about my own situation when I was sick uh, with my COVID-19 symptoms. For two months. I was very vulnerable about that. And people saw me go through that without health insurance as a candidate, you know, and then immediately following that George Floyd and Breonna Taylor protest, people saw, OK, she's right back out there, even as a congressional candidate, she's out there organizing and leading protests. And I didn't like try to hide that part of me. People saw, OK, she's been doing this. Now we understand she started talking about this in 2015, in 2016, 2014. And now in 2020, she's still saying the same thing. We get it. And so people said, we want an active leader. And they showed up. So uh, Jamal, 
um, Corey and you uh, and Monday, you all ran on a progressive, progressive platform. What lessons should the political experts derive from the from all the progressive uh, leadership that you were providing and how the public was responding to it at the polls? Yeah, I would say uh, pay more attention to the people, uh, the real people on the ground, the real people in our communities, the real people doing doing the organizing. There's a huge disconnect between the machine and the establishment and mainstream media and what's happening on the ground in our neighborhoods. So our focus from the very beginning was connecting with disengaged voters, you know, connecting with voters who may not have participated in 2018 or 2016. We wanted to target them and we wanted to pull them into the process so that they knew that their voices mattered, not just for this election, but their voices mattered in terms of being a part of our democracy and moving our democracy in the right direction. So as we talk about our progressive values, to all of us here on this call, that's common sense to us, right? And it's also common sense to the majority of American people. When you poll the majority of American people, they are crystal clear. We live in the wealthiest nation on earth. We should be able to provide exemplary health care to every single person on, in this country. We should be able to provide housing as a human right. We should be able to fully fund our schools. We should be able, especially now, we should consider uh, canceling student debt and make, make, making public college free. Why? We are the wealthiest nation on earth. The majority of the people are struggling. So when we spoke to them and we connected to them and we listened to them, there's a, there's a natural uh, bridge between what they need and what the progressive movement is fighting for. Uh, so that's what happened in our race. And that's why we were able to triple voter turnout triple turnout amongst young people and people of color and that's why that movement our movement is continuing to grow and hopefully the establishment and mainstream media begins to pay attention and lean in in a different way yeah and you know they keep saying to us that we're you know we're socialists and uh and they're capitalists and what we say is what i said was they, when they said well how can we afford all that education health care housing and i said and I'm sure you guys did too. Well, how did we afford the trillions of dollars in tax breaks that Bush and Trump gave to millionaires and billionaires who didn't need it? And so, so I said, right. we'll just have to repeal all those tax breaks and then we'll have trillions of dollars for healthcare and education and for the environment and for uh, other needs. And then they don't know what to do because they don't know how to, how to defend the tax breaks for millionaires and billionaires. And then Bernie and I, in the last week of July, we brought out onto the floor an amendment and the amendment was to cut the defense budget by 10%. Just to see how many people who said there is no money. We said, well, if you want the money for the coronavirus relief, there it is. Let's just put it on the streets of America to help people with it. And of course, the Republicans all vote against it. And a lot of Democrats voted against it too. But I just think you've got to give people a preview of coming attractions. Here it comes. You know, you want to know how we're going to pay for it? You know, we know where the money is. Uh, we just have to go and grab it back and put it into the hands of the people who really have earned it and need it. So, Mondia, you represent this incredible progressive change. And I know, and Jamal just mentioned it, in my race, we think we doubled the turnout of under 35-year-old voters, doubled it. And of course, the old conventional wisdom is, well, young people are nice to have around, but they just don't vote. So. What happened in your vote, in, in your race, with uh, young people on, on all these progressive issues? Young people are the demographic that compelled me to uh, You know, Senator, I don't come from money or from a political family in the way that we're used to seeing in our politics. Uh, I, I, as many people know, I grew up in Section 8 housing and on food stamps, and I was raised by a young single mom like like Corey, like, like so many incredible women all throughout my district and all throughout this country who worked multiple jobs just to put food on the table for us. And of course, I wouldn't be here today without her. Uh, and she got help raising me from my grandparents. My grandfather was a janitor and my grandmother cleaned homes. And when daycare was too expensive, she took me to work with her. Now I get to run and represent the same people whose homes I watched my grandmother clean growing up. Uh, but to the establishment and to the media, you know, I was the kind of candidate who would have no shot 
at winning in the 19th most affluent congressional district in the country, uh, having started out as a primary challenger against the powerful chair of the House Appropriations Committee, the majority white district in the suburbs of New York City here in Westchester and Rockland counties. Uh, and we defied expectations every step of the way. And it was because largely of young people, college and high school students, uh, and, and even younger than that, who jumped on the phones and made hundreds and hundreds of thousands of calls and sent hundreds and hundreds of thousands of text messages. And, and they relationally organized. And when we were able to, before COVID-19 descended upon us, they were out knocking on doors early on in the campaign season. That's how we were able to build a movement. Uh, and it is young people who, you know, came out to vote in a way that they had never come out to vote before because guess what? Somebody was finally speaking to their needs and offering the kind of leadership that they have long deserved, but frankly have never had in, in politics or had too little of anyway. Uh, and so I'm so excited about what the future holds. I see what young people did in your race. And I'm so excited about enacting things like a Green New Deal with young people at the helm. Yeah, thank you, Monday. You know, uh, my father drove a truck for the Hood Mill Company. Uh, he grew up on the first floor of a triple decker with five brothers and sisters uh, in Lawrence, Massachusetts, which is our poorest community in Massachusetts. And uh, and my mother, uh, it was a, they were an immigrant family. My grandmother and grandfather had they had five daughters, but my grandmother died when my mother was seventeen, so she had to be a single mom to her three younger sisters. So right now I'm in I'm in my house. This is the house where I was raised. I, I I've made it exactly three blocks from where they got off the boat from Ireland, uh, and it's like this thousand a thousand square foot house. I'm still in it here in Malden, and no one had me up on the school board as a W when I was running because I was a commuter to college, a commuter to law school. You have to take on all these student loans. You got to work all the way through to make it. And, uh, and it even seems, let's be honest, it seems unlikely to you that you can do it too. You have to, you have to work your way to a point where you can see yourself in the United States Congress. It almost seems like a, a mission to the moon, right? With no rocket ship, how are you gonna get there? So I found actually when I ran the first time and this time, the rocket ship were young people, you know, with this incredible energy that wanna really see big changes in our country. So how did, what role did young people play in your campaign, uh, Corey? <laughs> everything <laughs> you know and let me say down to the six-year-olds you know it you know we had I had there is a picture of me um bending down talking to um this young girl and who was so excited to campaign I mean she had been working for this campaign she had been knocking doors passing out uh you know passing out uh our flyers you know uh, so from the as, as young as they can, they could be, they were out helping with our camp, with our campaign. And then also, like Mondaire said, you know, uh, we had nearly nearly uh, half a million uh, phone calls made. You know, we knocking doors. We were able to knock. You know, in the time of COVID, you know, in one month, you know, right after um, restrictions were lifted in our district, you know, 23,000 doors. We were able to mobilize um, over 20,000 people who had never who had never voted before, or from our immigrant community who were already registered that had just said that they didn't feel like they had a voice. Uh, and so, um, young people really helped push this campaign. When I mean our social meet from our social media presence to um, just getting the word out, showing up for our um, you know before COVID, being there for our town halls because we were having town halls on um, economic justice. Uh, Medicare for all, um, canceling student debt, just uh, the Green New Deal, just so many. Um, oh, well, that was a part of the economic uh, justice. I mean, uh, environmental justice, but prison reform. Um, and so, young people were like out, but but young people weren't out just showing up and just pushing stuff on social media. They were telling their parents, and they were telling their grandparents, like, you got to listen to her, you got to show up for her, and they were changing hearts and minds. That's how that thing happened. We, because people in our district were so used to voting for a particular name, 52 years voting for the same name for the same seat. Not even, even before that, there was voting for that for that name. But for that particular seat, 52 years. So there were people who didn't know any other name. And so they had to do a lot of work telling their grandparents, you know, and great grandparents and their parents, like, this, can, this change um, should happen. 
And so they worked so hard. Um, the text messages, like everything was just um, on point. And then even just being TikTok, like they were putting stuff out, you know, I would find out, you know, they were pushing stuff, you know, making videos, stuff I still haven't seen. Um, so that's a whole other movement, you know, of them feeling like there was ownership. They had ownership of, you know, of this campaign. Like it was not just about me. It was not putting me on the pedestal. It was us all working together. And that, so they had buy-in and they still, they're still with us. That's the thing from all over the country. They're still with us. Yeah, and you know, Corey, I did a thing on TikTok just yesterday, 415,000 views in what? 24 hours. TikTok, <laughs> oh yeah, yeah. And you know oh, what happens? Gotta... <laughs> well, the, what happens is the 15 and 16 year olds then show it to their parents or their grandparents. You know, you're working, it, you're working it backwards <laughs> with these young people saying, this is an issue, you know, this is something I care about. So if you talk to them, they're gonna respond. And, and, and maybe, Jamal, maybe you could talk about this because Again, young people are your life. It's what you've done. And a lot of times people look down on young people. Well, we'll just appeal to them because they're young as though they don't care about issues. They don't care about things. But if you challenge them, huh, you get a you get a political payback. So can you talk a little bit about your campaign and, and how you did that? Well, you know, I've been blessed to work in education for 20 years uh, at different levels of education as a teacher, uh, school counselor, and middle school principal. And it's been the, the brilliance, the genius, the energy of young people that have inspired my entire career. And they inspired my run for office in the first place. And because we were able, we were a school of social action. So issues of social justice were embedded in our curriculum. So when, when Darren Wilson was not indicted for killing Mike Brown in Ferguson, we marched the streets of the Bronx chanting no justice, no peace with our middle school kids. When um, Occupy Wall Street was taking place downtown uh, in, in, on, in Wall Street, near Wall Street, we went on a school trip to visit <coughs> Occupy Wall Street. So our kids uh, became, ah. were socially conscious and became even more so uh, as part of our school. And my daughter is, is six years old. Uh, and she's incredibly conscious of us living through a global pandemic and the impact of the coronavirus of communities, both here uh, in this district and around the country. All kids gotta do is turn on the news. Uh, once they turn on the news, they become aware of what's happening in the country. And young people were the drivers of the civil rights movement. They were the drivers of movements throughout American history. And they have the ideas and the naivete, I would say, to be innovative and creative and coming up with new ways to accomplish whatever task is put in front of them. So for our campaign, it was the same thing. Corey hit it on the head. We had children telling their parents that they better vote for Jamal Bowman. Uh, because Jamal Bowman was a breath of fresh air and Mondaire Jones is a breath of fresh air and Corey Bush is a breath of fresh air because we're regular people. We have, our stories are their stories. Our communities are their communities and young people can feel that and relate to that differently. And when young people get excited, parents get excited as well. They're like, damn, now my kid is, is excited about politics. I better listen to them and I better engage with them. So that those are some of the things that happen uh, in our race. Yeah, was there was there a particular tool that you used to reach young people with, with, with social media? Was it TikTok and Instagram? And can you talk a little bit about that? I'm embarrassed to say I'm late on the TikTok train. Uh, get, hey, get, but, get on TikTok. Yeah, All I can on, tell you is wait, you wait, want wait, to talk wait. to 15 year olds, it's the ultimate reverse Listen, takedown. You so go we, through the 15 we ran, year olds and you get mom and dad. Yeah, no, we ran ads on, on some of the app games that kids play. So we, we did some of that. But as you just mentioned TikTok before, I texted my, my new chief of staff like, yo, we got to get on TikTok. So thank you. <laughs> thank you for that. Me but too. We, we were on IG. <laughs> We were on IG and we were on uh, Twitter uh, quite a bit uh, and Facebook as well, even though Facebook is for a slightly older crowd. But even, but direct to camera videos and engaging uh, that way on social media also pulls in uh, many young people as well. Yeah, so um, again, back to you, back to you, Mondaire, about young people in your campaign. You were, you were, uh, you're like a, 
um, who is this guy? Yeah. Why should I vote for him? Well, first of all, he is a young person, okay? He's <laughs> way younger than me, okay? I'm an old <laughs> man compared to my dad. That's first of all. And, and, and yet, Jamal, you are still young for United States Congress. That's right. <laughs> That's true. And that we are actively changing, so. <laughs> well, I, and I would just say this, when Alexandria Ocasio-Cortez uh, endorsed me last, all of us. last September, she said, it's not your age, it's the age of your ideas that are important. Oh. So it's almost regardless of your age, it's the young people are going to be judging the age of your ideas. My opponent was 39 years old, right? But I won under 35 year olds, 71% to 29%. It was the ideas. It was the issues they cared about. You know, that's what gets them excited. And so, and so then we have Mondia. And you're right. This is this is our young guy here. So, so tell us, <laughs> tell us how you parlayed your your age and your technological savvy, you know, into this victory. You know, so, you know, I, I'm, I'm sort of chuckling to myself because I, I think of myself as a as a young 33 year old, but it, you know, college and high school students are very quick to remind me that I'm actually not so young, but, um, <laughs> which is a huge blow to my to my to my uh, to my image of myself. Um, you know, I'm I'm so I'm so glad to to hear Jamal and Corey talk about how it was young people and, and you, Senator, talk about how it was young people sort of telling their parents to vote. Uh, because that is exactly what happened in my race. I mean, I, I can't tell you how many parents came to me and said, the way that I heard about you, including donors, by the way, <laughs> the way that I heard about you was because my kid, you know, told me to pay attention to your campaign. And to your point, Jamal, I mean, if, if, you're, if you're a parent, one of your goals is that your kid will be like politically aware, right? To know about what's going on around them. And so if your kid all of a sudden, maybe for the first time, uh, comes to them and says, hey, there's this guy running to represent us in Congress. We ought to be paying attention to him. Uh, then you're going to pay attention to that and you're you're very much likely to, to be supportive of that candidate who's gotten your, your, your young person all, all excited about politics for the first time. And so that was that was really powerful. There were folks after the election uh, on June 23rd who came to me and said, uh, you know, I stayed out until 11 p.m. on, on, on June 23rd. Uh, and it's because I couldn't go home and, and tell my kid that I didn't cast a vote for him. So I, I just stayed out there. And, and that, is, that is the power that, one of the many powers that young people have. They're also extremely sophisticated um, and, and, and very creative. I mean, I, I can't get over that, that, that Markyverse uh, uh, video that you had, man. I've seen that thing at least 15 times. And I've actually spoken to the, the guy who created it because I'm like, dude, if I ever run for anything in the future, I want you to make something for me like that because that was a game change. Well, I mean, there was a lot that you did. The, the idea is being most important, obviously. Well, that was that's like what, uh, what Mondaire is talking about um, is that we did a three minute ad, which is completely unconventional. And uh, we popped it up in Twitter and we had five million views uh, of this wow. three minute commercial, you know, talking about built the Green New Deal, Medicare for all the need for racial criminal justice in our country. Uh, and so it was uh, it was all just message, but as Mondaire was saying, it was like targeting mostly young people, but then young people were showing it to their parents. You know, this is what we should be talking about. These are the issues that we should be raising. And um, and so, and then it morphs over into Instagram and TikTok, and it all takes off in a way that I have to consult with my 19-year-old advisors to tell me how they, in fact, recreate this. They create this recombinant political DNA that is the modern digital campaign. But uh, but uh, it's all based on issues, though. It's all based on what you believe in and what those young people believe in. So what do you think, Corey? What do you, what is, what's the message to Congress that your elections, and the elections in 2018, what, is it, what does it mean for what Congress should now be doing in, um, in, in responding to this issue-based wave that's happening across the country that says we want fundamental change? What's your message going out onto the uh, House floor next year? Yeah, listen to us like listen to us we're not going away you know I had to I said this uh, to someone very recently 
um, uh, to a member very recently who was coming back at me about, you know, you need incremental change. You got to understand incremental change. And I was like, you got to understand Medicare for all. Um, and I said that because, and I wasn't going to, you know, allow that person to push me back because at, like I told them, while you're talking about incremental change, people are dying. You know, and so I didn't go, there was no nurses, you know, nursing one-on-one -on -one class that said, these are the people that you allow to die. These are the people that get to live. Like there was no class for that. Um, and so I, you know, so I can't understand the language. So because of that, you, they will continue to have people like us who are gonna step up and run. And so, and, and I welcome it. The thing is, do they, is there time for them to make a change and say, you know what, we're going to listen and we're going to do things differently? Absolutely. But if they won't, if they keep pushing us out, because I remember what was said about, um, about Alex when she went, when AOC won, it was, oh, that was just, that was like a lightning rod, you know, oh, that was a one-off, you know, that can't happen in the Midwest and all of these things. Well, it has happened and it's happened more. It wasn't just one moment, you know, it, it has happened more um, in 2020 and it will happen more in 2022 and 2024. We'll keep coming. And not only will we keep coming, we're going to go look for others. You know, at least I can speak for myself anyway. I'm looking, I'm like, where y'all at? Because I'm ready for, you know, to help other people like me win because that's the only way, if they won't open up those doors and say, we are listening to you and we hear it, we know that you don't like people dying in your communities. We know that um, that we've allowed this to fester and go on for too long. But I have seen, so me, myself, being someone who's been unsure, uninsured, who's uninsured right now, who went through my COVID situation that way, as someone who has had my credit jacked up because of all that I went through, going to the hospital for a toothache kind of stuff, you know, um, and then how that has affected my life um, since then. And then being someone who has been the nurse and watching my patients die, I have literally physically watched my patients die after rationing their med medication or watch them die because they just didn't have access. They couldn't come anymore and I knew that they were dying and I, I we sent them home to die and they died. Like I, I've seen it. And so I can't just sit back and allow it. So that's my message to them is that I won't shut up. You know, we won't shut up. We won't back down. You can't change our minds because our job is to save our communities. And if nobody else will speak for them, I don't care about you liking me. I don't care about you having that relationship. I don't care about making money in this, in, in, in this. I don't care, none of that. I don't care about a title, fame, nothing. I care about saving the lives of my folks in my community because it feels like nobody else is really caring. And so will I? Will I step out and be vulnerable in that way? Do yeah, absolutely. So that's the message. <laughs> yeah, that is great. You know, when you have the planet is running a fever. There are no emergency rooms for planets, so we have to take bold action. That's the Green New Deal. When three billionaires, three billionaires control yep. more wealth than fifty percent of the population, there's something wrong. When, when tens of millions of people are losing their health insurance, you need Medicare for all. So that's what I said on the night I won on September 1st, I, I just said the age of incrementalism is over. We need big structural changes. So uh, Jamal, what, talk about- 60 million people, 60 million yeah. people is big. 60 million yeah. people dying, that's big. <laughs> so it, we need it, big change. It, it is, it, it's just an unbelievable world that Donald Trump has created for us, but at least it's crystallized yeah all of the underlying issues that maybe got hidden a little bit through incrementalism, but now we can see how huge they are. So Jamal, what's your message as you're coming out onto the floor of the United States House of Representatives, the board of directors for the United States of America? You know, what's your message to the rest of the board? So the message is, let's get it going. Uh, let's get it going right now, right? Because historically, it's always been about incrementalism. And it's always been about being patient when we're talking about Black folk, the Latinx community, the Indigenous community, the poor community. Let's be patient. Let's work from the perspective of incrementalism. But when Trump got elected, it, it was within a year, boom, trillion dollar tax breaks uh, for the wealthy on Wall Street. Uh, in the beginning of, of our nation, well, shortly after the Civil War, the Homestead Act, giving millions of acres of land uh, to, to the white community, both foreign born and domestic born. 
Uh, it's been the GI Bill. It's been the New Deal. It's been putting a man on the moon. When we want to do something as a nation, we get it done and we get it done right away. What we need to get done now is a Green New Deal, right now. Within 10 years, get into net zero carbon emissions, rebuilding our country, both physically, psychologically, and spiritually. That's what we need to get done within the next 10 years. And we got to get moving on it immediately. We need Medicare for all right now because no one should die because they do not have health care, period. We need housing as a human right, period. We need to fully fund our schools, period, right now. So I'm with Corey and I'm with Mandera as well. We're not talking incrementalism when you're talking about our children dying here in the Bronx, here in Yonkers, here in Mount Vernon, and then all the way across the country in places like Yemen as well. We got to do a lot better on foreign policy, domestic policy, and we have to center human rights and we have to do it right now. Yeah, you know, I, 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 I think, Jamal, you know, my mother was a brilliant woman and uh, she was going to be president of the senior class when my grandmother died. So the, the system is, well, one of the girls has to stay home. So that's my mother. So even though she could do calculus at the kitchen table for fun, she never got to go to college. Now, my brothers and I, then she had, after she raised the first family, her sisters then she had me at 39 and my my brothers at 40 so she had three boys in one year and then she started all over again you don't want to be raised by this woman by the way she knows too much she's too smart okay so so um so she would always say eddie i'm gonna donate your brain to harvard medical school as a completely unused human organ you know will you please you're we're, you're getting more opportunities than we've got you know you're not smarter you're never gonna work as hard as your father the milkman just please take advantage of these opportunities, you know, in this house that I still live in. And uh, and so you, Jamal, you see this, you can see opportunities denied to people that if they got them, if we funded them, you know, then they would be able to maximize their God-given abilities. But a vision without funding is an hallucination. You have to have the funding that provides the healthcare, the education, right? So, so, Mondia, talk about that message. You, you represent one of the wealthiest places in America, and you're delivering, delivering a message to help the poorest people in America be able to maximize their God-given abilities. Can you talk a little bit about that message and how it resonated amongst your Democratic uh, primary voters? It, 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 was, it was deeply resonant because you don't have to be very poor to benefit from the big structural changes that all of us on this call have been advocating in public life. I, I mean, my goodness, I've been I've been speaking about expanding the Supreme Court long before the tragic passing of Justice Ginsburg, including in the course of, of my very crowded eight person primary. Um, and, and and that was because even then we had a hyper partisan conservative majority on the Supreme Court that was and remains hostile to democracy itself, right? I mean, just a few days ago in South Carolina, the Supreme Court upheld a rule that says if in order for you to vote by absentee ballot, you have to have a witness in the midst of COVID, like certify that. I mean, this, these are the kinds of games that this court plays. And now I worry that we're gonna have a 6-3 hyper-partisan conservative majority uh, and, and it was already the case that every June, people like myself, members of the LGBTQ community, wait to see whether we're going to have rights taken away from us or extended to us by the Supreme Court that we should have had a long time ago. You know, uh, women all across this country are going to be worried about whether they'll still have bodily autonomy because this is, will be a Supreme Court majority that will be willing to strike down Roe v. Wade. Uh, and, and for all the folks who said after the, the passing of our legend, John Lewis, in the House of Representatives that we ought to pass the John Lewis Voting Rights Act. I've been reminding folks that that is a piece of legislation that this conservative majority on the Supreme Court is unlikely to uphold on review. So we have to advocate the big structural changes. And thankfully from that to Medicare for all, which as you know, a majority of Americans now support because nothing like a global pandemic to really drive home the point that healthcare should not be tied largely to your employment status, and so on and so forth, are things that people from the wealthy on down to lower income people like the household in which I grew up understand we absolutely need. 
And we just need really good messengers, people who can speak from personal experience, from their lived experience and inform the policy making discussion. It's why I like to say that I'm running for Congress because for me, policy is personal. Yeah, and uh, and that's that's the most powerful message. That, that's what you're bringing. You're bringing lived experiences to the floor of the United States Congress. You can get in the face of the people on the other side of the aisle with your lived experiences. They don't have answers for what you have seen, what you have lived. And actually on the night that Justice Ginsburg passed away, I actually said if the Republicans try to, try to confirm a new judge, they're stolen two seats at that point. We should just end the filibuster and debate expanding the Supreme Court next year. And a lot of people have been criticizing me, but it'll be 6-3. And it's Roe v. Wade, it's Affordable Care Act, civil rights, LGBTQ, you name it. It's just all going to be on the chopping block and we just have to be realistic about it. So maybe we could talk here a little bit about Joe Biden, Kamala Harris, that ticket. Uh, and why it's so important for people to get out and work for their election on November 3rd, uh, so that we can turn the page on this era and start moving towards debating the progressive agenda that we need in our country. So can you talk a little bit, Corey, about how you think people should be viewing this candidacy of Joe Biden versus, um, versus Donald Trump? Sure, uh, you know, and I'm gonna speak about the people that have felt like you know, I don't care for who the candidate the candidate is, um, uh, who the nominee is. I'm speaking to them because I, 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 I get it. Uh, but um, a, a friend of mine said something the other day that I felt was just like on point. Her name is Kayla Reed. She's an organizer here locally. And she said, um, well, then vote conditions and not candidates. You know, so who is speaking to your condition? Who is speaking, who is, who is the one that's gonna get you closer to the goal um, to fix your condition or the conditions you care about? Um, and then that's who you should be voting for. And because I know who you are, that is not going to be Donald Trump. You know, we've seen what he, what he has been doing. Um, also, um, when we talk about the communities that we are fighting for, you know, we're um, especially like for me, I'm fighting um, for people that look like me. Um, hard. I'm fighting for black and brown communities. I'm fighting for indigenous communities. I'm fighting for um, for women, for marginalized communities, for everybody that's disenfranchised and, you know, um, under-resourced, underrepresented. Well, though, those same communities will be hit harder by a Trump administration and a Trump presidency. If he knows he has four more years, you know, if he, he will then, he feels he's untouchable now. He feels he's invincible now. So what will happen with executive orders and everything else, whether, whether he's breaking laws, you know, what will happen if he has more, four more years and he doesn't have to worry about reelection? What happens if he thinks he's the lifetime president? So we can't allow it. What's going to get us closer to our needs uh, being met? That's going to be, um, Joe Biden and Kamala Harris. Yeah, vote and, and lastly, I, yeah, vote conditions and not and, and not candidates if, if that's your issue. But the other thing is, you know, we got to remember somebody's going to sit in that seat and somebody's going to get paid to sit in that seat. So like by not voting and not showing up, somebody's going to get there. And then that person is going to have, you know, it doesn't just come, it's not just the president. And I get so, it bothers me when people say it like, oh, it's just, you know, that's just one person. No, it's a whole administration. And, and it's not only is it in an administration, it's an administration that's going to talk up, that's going to deal with your education, that they're going to, you know, they're going to strip away um, rights. They're going to take away, um, and look at the Supreme Court, you know, so it's somebody who, who has a lot of power and and they get to have minions all over the country in governor seats, in U.S. Senate seats, in, you know, just all over in our local government, in our state seats. They have these minions that are hurting our communities directly. So that's why it's so important. Got it. I love, voting. I love voting conditions. I love it. Um, yeah. Jamal. A vote for Donald Trump is a, is a vote for terror, quite frankly. I mean, look at what's happening at the border. You know, we have families being separated at the border. We have children in cages. We have uh, immigrant women having hysterectomies performed on them and a forced sterilization. Uh, we have a travel ban that's targeting uh, black and brown Muslim countries. Uh, this is what we have under this president. Uh, we have no movement on the HEROES Act. We have no aid coming. Uh, to our cities and states and our schools and communities that have been hardest hit. 
and we have over 210,000 people dead and that number is growing every day and another four in another four years we have no idea uh, how many more will be dead for something else that's going to happen that we can't even predict so a vote for trump is a vote for terror it's a vote for fascism it's a vote for oppression versus a vote for biden and to quote my sister congresswoman ocasio-cortez it, it allows democracy to live another day uh and i rather fight with someone in my own family, which is another Democrat, then fight with someone outside of my family. Because at least that fight within the family can hopefully move us in a more progressive direction. And as the country continues to rise up against oppression, a Biden-Harris White House, I believe, will be more responsive to that. And a, and a Democratic-controlled uh, Senate will be, will be more responsive to that. And listen, Trump won Michigan by 11,000 votes last time around. Uh, he won Pennsylvania by a small amount of votes. He won Florida by a small amount of votes. If people come out and vote, if they would have come out and vote in 2016, we wouldn't be in this position in the first place. We had 94 million people that did not vote in 2016. We have to shift that dramatically uh, and give democracy another chance and give democracy a chance with people like us in Congress. Because prior to 2018, I didn't see many people like us in Congress, but now that we're there, I know that we're gonna do the work and raise our voices and do what's necessary to move our country forward. Yeah, and, and by the way, what a great message, right? To have a vice president who is half African-American, half Asian-American as the second most powerful person in the United States. That's a great message, huh? Woman of color, black woman. That's just, that's, it's just, it's incredible. It's just an incredible message to, to young people all across the country. You know, the future is arriving. Uh, Mondale, Joe Biden, Kamala Harris. J Joe Biden, uh, I don't think was the, the first choice of anybody on this panel in the, in, the, in the Democratic primary for president, but he will still be the most progressive president of the United States in American history. And we must do everything we can to elect him and Kamala Harris. You want to talk about democracy living another day, democracy is on its last breath. It's on its last leg right now. Every day there is a an increasingly successful effort to undermine democracy uh, that will have lasting permanent effects. And we've got one shot. We've got one shot now and it's already started because folks are casting their ballots by mail. They're voting early in person. Uh, some people are waiting until November 3rd. I recommend voting as early as possible uh, because this is a president that seeks to undermine the Postal Service. I mean, who would have thought that that would be a thing under consideration? Um, you know, and, and, and so we, we have to make sure that we elect someone with whom we can work as the most progressive Congress in United States history on issues like a Green New Deal, the only thing that comes close to to saving the planet from climate catastrophe with 10 years left on the clock. We don't have time to vote third party or to vote for anyone other than Joe Biden and Kamala Harris. And I think it is very clear the results of having four more years of Donald Trump, which uh, I don't think we can, we can withstand four more years of this. Beautiful. You know, I'm tempted to just end it there with what uh, each of you have just said, but I'd like to go around one final time. You get the last word, Mondaire. But one final time, so what is it that all of these viewers and others who are on right now who will be following this, what, what, what's your one minute message to them? Where we are in history, what this election means uh, as a turning point in American and world history. Corey, if you could start. When they tell you that you don't have a voice, when they tell you that you are not powerful, when they tell you you have to sit back and wait your turn, when they tell you you haven't done enough, you don't look the part, sound the part, didn't come from the right place, don't have the right money, don't have the right title, didn't do it right, didn't, when they tell you all of those things, you don't have the right family, you're not from the right place, when they tell you all of those things, push forward, keep moving, keep going, keep learning, keep educating yourself, keep stay active, keep pushing, because when you push, you get to the place where you win. The only way you don't win, the only way we don't get 
to the goal of our issues and our uh, our needs being met is when we quit. So don't quit. You have power. It's within you. Link up with other people. Let's do this and we can win all of this together. Beautiful. Thank you, Corey. Jamal. Mm -hmm. Democracy is a contact sport. You have to engage physically with it each and every day in some capacity. Democracy is a contact sport. And if you want power, you have to take it. It will not be given to any of us willingly. This system of oppression has been in place for 401 years and it's ramped up over the last 50 years from an economic perspective, which has led to the plantation capitalism that is currently in place. We want power right now. We have to get active and engaged and we have to take it. And as we were talking about young people earlier, I need to give a quick shout out to the Sunrise Movement who's doing great work when it comes to the Green New Deal and environmental justice. So I wanted to shout them out and shout out to all of the grassroots organizations that have supported all of our campaigns that are doing the work on the ground. We are three movement candidates and we will continue to work with the movement while we are in Congress. But we need everyone engaged in our democracy. It's a contact sport. Get active, stay active on a daily basis. Great. Mondia. You have the last word. There was um, a famous politician who a few decades ago said that the, the era of big government is over. Uh, and, and of course, uh, he was wrong. Uh, and so after the successful sweeping victories in, in New York, uh, from the congressional level on down to state assembly and state senate, uh, and after Corey's upset victory in Missouri, I tweeted out the statement that the the era of small ideas is <laughs> and and I think that what's happening in our politics nationally and, and locally is uh, demonstrably, uh, it, it is true based on what we have been observing and it's only going to get better for us if we keep working hard, if we keep defying expectations and not listening to people who uh, have have been proven wrong time and time again and, and no longer deserve, frankly, a platform to dictate to us what ought to be true about our politics. Uh, and and but that requires that requires doing everything that we need to do uh, from now on up to November 3rd and then rolling up our sleeves and working alongside the four of us on this on this panel uh, to enact the, the boldest uh, most progressive vision for this country uh, that it has ever seen. And and we will do that together. We've already started this important work and I'm so excited about what we're gonna accomplish together. Thank you, Mondeer, so much. And, uh, and thank the three of you, just uh, generational leaders arriving on the floor of the United States uh, Congress and uh, with a message, almost like latter-day Paul Revere's just giving the word, something new is happening here. There's a revolution of Bruin, and uh, and you've got to get ready, to get get up and and start uh, getting ready for battle. In my primary um, on September 1st, we broke the all-time record for highest turnout uh, in a primary in Massachusetts history. That's a lot of elections, but we smashed the record for turnout. Just destroyed the record for turnout. And a lot of it was activism. It was the movement. Like you're saying, Jamal, it was the Sunrise Movement. It was all these young people who came in. Uh, uh, Mondaire, you know, the, the those are the people who did that ad, the three minute ad. You know, just uh, just saying, no, we got a, we got a movement here. We got to get up. We got to do the work. You can't beg for your, your rights. You got to take them. And uh, you just got to get up and do the work. So. Uh, so we really do encourage everybody to do everything you can for these final four weeks. That's how many are left. This is our 1932. This is our 1860. It, one of, an election like this does not happen that often, where history turns. And uh, and so we need uh, we need everybody who is watching tonight to know that uh, if you help elect Joe Biden and Kamala Harris. You can see what's about to arrive in the United States Congress to make sure that that progressive agenda uh, is a big IOU that comes out of this election. 
uh, in the beginning next January 20th, uh, it will no longer uh, be an election. It will be action on the floor of the United States House and Senate implementing that progressive agenda, Green New Deal, Medicare for All, racial justice, criminal justice, educational, healthcare justice for everyone in our country. Uh, and these three great seminal leaders uh, will be out there and you will hear their voices. They are about to become very famous members of the United States Congress. Uh, thank you all for joining us tonight. And uh, thanks to my three great um, guests tonight and partners in this progressive movement. Thank you.